purpose of the uh, members of Congress and the President isn't to make us safe. The Second Amendment is supposed to make us safe. Thank God for the truth. A candidate whose message of sound money, free markets, personal freedom, and a non-interventionist foreign policy has inspired a generation of rabble-rousing libertarians, of which your host is one, to rage against the machine. Tonight, what if the state of freedom in America is actually worse than you think? Property rights and the Constitution. When we were colonists and ruled by the King of England, he devised ingenious ways to tax us. One of the most hateful was called the Stamp Act. It required that everyone in the colonies affix a stamp to every piece of paper in his possession. Thus, every book, letter, and financial document, every mortgage, deed, and lease, every pamphlet or poster destined to be nailed to a tree had to bear the king's stamp. Question, how did the British government know if all your papers had the king's stamp affixed to them? Answer, Parliament enacted the Writs of Assistance Act. These abominable laws permitted British soldiers to write their own search warrants. Thus, British soldiers could knock on the door of the home of a colonist and hand the owner a piece of paper on which the soldier had authorized himself to enter the, enter the home, ostensibly to look for the stamps. This was the last straw for many of our forefathers. The uproar here was so great that the Stamp Act and the Writs of Assistance Acts were actually repealed by the Parliament. But it was too late. Any government that will permit its agents to enter a private home on a whim, without any evidence of any crime, the colonists reasoned, could do anything it wanted to property and liberty, it was time for that government to go. So go it did. We fought a revolution. We won the revolution. We wrote a constitution. And in the constitution, the framers assured that the government that they created here would never be able to do to them what the king and parliament had done. Hence the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees the right to be left alone. It requires that the government can only come onto private property without the consent of the occupant if it has a search warrant. And search warrants may only be issued by judges, and judges may only issue search warrants after they have found probable cause of a crime on the property. For 200 years, this right to privacy was more often than not respected by the government. Then after 9-11, our freedoms began to unravel. Congress enacted the Patriot Act. It permits federal agents to write their own search warrants and serve them on persons who have custody of your records. That includes your grocer, your telephone company, your computer server, your car dealer, your jeweler, your bodega, your lawyer, your banker, your doctor, even your mailman. Well, how can the government capture your computer keystrokes as you type them or read your mail before you receive it? Because it doesn't care about the Constitution. Think of how our civil liberties have been undermined in these past 10, 10 years. And it has been fear, and some of it you can understand it, but it doesn't justify it. And we have accepted this notion uh, in, in, this, in this last decade that it's okay to sacrifice some of our liberties to be safe. <laughs> Is correct. It is never necessary to sacrifice liberty for to, for the safety. And the founder said, if you do, you're not going to be safe, and and you will and and you will lose everything. You will not, and you'll lose your liberties as well. And that is what happened. So immediately after 9/11, within a week or two, we passed this thing called the Patriot Act. <laughs> Personally, some members of Congress have voted for the Patriot Act because they said it sounded good. I argued with one member on the day he was voting for it, and I said, why are you voting for this? You haven't even had time to read it. This just came up an hour ago. He said, oh, I know. I said, you know, there's some bad stuff in this bill. He says, I, I know. And I said, why are you going to vote for it? He says, well, I just can't go home and explain to my constituents under these conditions why I voted against the Patriot Act. I said, well, that's your job. Go home and explain it to them. Very simply, the answer is send only people to Washington, send only people to the White House that know and understand and read the Constitution and enforce the Constitution.
Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to this bill. I was opposed to the Patriot Act in 2001 and do not believe now that it's a good idea to extend it. The, the conclusion was that the American people had too much privacy. And if we undermine the American people's privacy, somehow or another, we're going to be safer. I think another thing that has come up lately has been that the purpose of government is to make us perfectly safe. Now, it is good to be safe, but governments can't make us safe. I question whether or not we have been made safer by the Patriot Act, but let's say a law makes us somewhat safer. Is that a justification for the government to do anything they want? But it does extend what Gentleman's I consider and others consider bad legislation. I ask for a no vote on this legislation. What if your elected representatives actually voted to declare the United States of America a battlefield? You said something, uh, Senator Lieberman, that I think we need to sort of absorb. As the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, do you believe that the likelihood of American citizens being recruited and enlisted and radicalized on behalf of Al-Qaeda is going up? Is that what you're trying to tell us? Uh, Mr. President, I say to my friend from South Carolina, uh, I not only believe it, it, it's shown by the facts. I, I wish I had them, the numbers exactly in front of me, but if, if you chart uh, attempts at terrorist attacks on the U.S., and here I'm limiting to people who are affiliated with the global Islamist extremist uh, movement, um, there were a few after 9-11, but a few after 9-11, but in the last two or three years, the numbers have gone up dramatically. Now, I want to say, uh, hasten to say, that uh, these represent a very, very small percentage of the Muslim American community. But, of course, it doesn't take too many people to cause great havoc. We have enforcement officials, Homeland Security officials, saying that the toughest, the, the, the most dangerous threat right now to the homeland security of the American people comes from homegrown terrorists who have been self-radicalized or radicalized by somebody else. Well, I think that's important for us to understand. Do you agree with me that when you look at the war on terror, that the United States is part of the battlefield? Well, there's no question that our enemies uh, have declared it part of the battlefield. The very uh, commencement, official commencement of the war against Islamist terrorism, 9-11, was an attack on America's homeland, on, on civilians. On so, compare that to Rod Paul. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to introduce a very simple piece of legislation to repeal the infamous Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Section 1021 essentially codifies into law the very dubious claim of presidential authority under, 10, under 2001 authorization for the use of military force to indefinitely detain American citizens without access to legal representation or due process of law. Section 1021 provides for the possibility of the U.S. military acting as a kind of police force on U.S. soil, apprehending terror suspects, including Americans, and whisking them off to an undisclosed location indefinitely. No right to attorney, no right to trial, no day in court. Sadly, too many of my colleagues are too willing to undermine our Constitution to support such outrageous legislation. One senator even said about American citizens being picked up under section, under this section of the NDAA, quote, when they say, I want a lawyer, you tell them, shut up. You don't get a lawyer, close quote. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. Your time you don't get a lawyer. You're an enemy combatant, and we're going to talk to you about why you joined Al-Qaeda. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. We can hold them forever. We can hold them forever. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. Compare that to Ron Paul. Is this really the kind of a United States we want to create in name of fighting terrorism? 
I hope my colleagues will join my effort to overturn this shameful section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. And I yield back. What about the president declaring unilaterally by executive order that he can be the prosecutor, that he can be the judge and the jury and the executioner? And that the law of the land says that the president can make the decision to assassinate an American citizen. Anwar al-Awlaki, a person who held himself out as a Muslim cleric, but whom the president says was really a murderous thug who helped kill innocents, was blown to pieces when an unmanned drone operated by American forces delivered a missile to a convoy of cars in which Mr. Alaki was traveling in the country of Yemen. So let's use the example of Anwar al-Awlaki. Uh, we... Mr. Alawaki, a member of Al-Qaeda, was actually killed by us overseas. By the way, I agreed with the administration taking that step to take out Mr. Alawaki, who was a great danger to our country overseas. A well-deserved death, the neocons called this killing. The Constitution could not be clearer on this. The Fifth Amendment states in part that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It doesn't say no person except those deemed dangerous by the president. It doesn't say no person except those whom the president declares to be enemy combatants. It doesn't say no person except those against whom the president claims to have secret evidence. It simply states no person. This due process requirement is the linchpin of the entire constitution. From it comes the presumption of innocence that all persons are presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. From it comes the government's duty of transparency and fairness, and it applies to all persons, even non-Americans. But that's not an issue here because Mr. Alaki, as you may know, was born in New Mexico, United States of America. Uh, I think that... No, you, you said that he was responsible for these things. I'm, yes, but again... Is there going to be any evidence presented? Uh, you know... I don't have anything for you on that. Do you not see at all, does the administration not see at all how a president asserting that he has the right to kill an American citizen without due process and that he's not going to even explain why he thinks he has that right is troublesome to some people? I don't, I don't have anything on that for you. What do you think constitutional law professor Barack Obama would think of this? I think he spoke about it today. So instead of due process, we have a secret execution based on secret evidence and a secret legal reasoning. No public record, no appeal to these people in the government. The Constitution be damned. This is the first time in recorded American history since the Civil War that the president has used the military to kill Americans without due process. And it might not be the last. Who will the president kill next? What if anyone could be detained indefinitely because we're all on a battlefield? What if the government could turn off the media that criticized it? What if one day the government targeted Freedom Watch? What if one night the government targeted you? What if we didn't have a chance to do anything about this because both the Republican wing and the Democratic wing of the big government party each sought to maintain this unfree status? The Congress a potted plant, or are they going to do something about this? Well, the, and too often the leadership uh, is uh, only in the business of preserving power, and that's what they argued about. It's a shame that all this arguing and bickering going on between the two parties, that there was a difference, but you know, regardless of which party you have, they still endorse, they don't change the definition to rights and entitlements, and they don't change the foreign policy, and they don't go after the Fed. I think the obligation of all of us should be the oath of office. We should take it shouldn't be the oath to the party. I'm sorry about that. But it isn't the oath to the party. It's the oath to our office to obey the law, and the law is the Constitution. Thank God for the truth. When this revolution is successful, it will not be a Republican monopoly at all. It will be bipartisan. It will be endorsed by all the American people. I believe it was Rousseau who said, when the social contract is broken, the people must revolt. It's up to the people. Revolt now or be a debt slave. Thank God for the truth.